parler hein, je sais pas si c'est normal Merci beaucoup. We are going to get started. Thank you. Il est midi 30 
It's half past 12 in Roma, in Paris. So we're going to get started with this International uh, Science Day uh, 2022 edition. Hi, everyone. My name is Raoul Mill, and I will be with you all day for this uh, uh, Science Day as a Tamada Master of Ceremonies in Georgian. Uh, I would have liked to sing uh, a few words, but we will have more uh, music and maybe singing later on. Welcome to everyone. Uh, it's uh, online, but it's real uh, a real uh, international day for science. Thank you for trusting us. It is a an global day with 800 participants from 50 countries. Uh, we have panelists from Paris, New York, Roma, Brussels, Montpellier, Marseille, and Ouagadougou. I'd like to uh, make a hint to Gerd, who told me he was going to connect from Himalaya in Nepal. So stay tuned, there will be many surprises. A surprise with a, a group of young scientists, the World Food Forum Young Scientists Group. Uh, I really warmly greet them and we will have a representative of this group, Leticia Magno, who will speak in the third session. Uh, you can follow us uh, on YouTube and you can chat directly in Zoom and uh, someone will uh, make a summary of, uh, Sophie will make a summary of sessions one and two and Leticia will make a summary of the third session. You are free to um, speak in any language, uh, in French or in English, uh, ask any question because freedom, improvisation, is the key. Uh, still, we need to be rigorous. Uh, everything is timed. So if a panelist is too enthusiastic, uh, he will have to be uh, cut by a few notes of music by Timothy. Uh, there are three things I'd like to answer right from the start. Uh, will presentations be available? Yes. Will the party be, will be the, the, the our event uh, be seen uh, broadcast uh, in replay? Yes. And uh, is it a, a normal webinar? No, it is uh, a party, uh, the International Day for Science, and it, it's going to be new every year. And I would like to uh, celebrate um, François Rabelais because our day is today's uh, under the patronage of François Rabelais. He was one of the first foresighters. Uh, he wrote uh, in 1532 a letter to Gargantua that uh, science without conscience ruins the soul. Uh, if you don't know uh, Pantagruel, who writes to um, to Gargant, uh, another very interesting character is Elix. If you don't know him, Elix is a uh, is an, our mascot uh, who was uh, created by a French uh, artist, Yassine Ait Kassi. And he, this uh, Elix is going to be with us uh, during the whole day. And I'm now going to give the floor uh, to uh, Madame Ambassador, Mrs. Jürgensen. Uh, and uh, she's going to introduce this Science Day. Merci beaucoup, cher Raoul, et bonjour à tous. Je suis... Thank you, dear Raoul. I am Céline Jorgensen. I am the ambassador and uh, representative uh, for France to the United Nations in Rome. And I am very happy to welcome you to the second edition of the International Science Festival focusing on agriculture, food and the environment. Last year, you were um, many to send, to be with us and to send positive feedback uh, on the first event that we organized uh, to celebrate the 30th birthday of the uh, science festival, the Science Day, that prompted us to launch a new edition this year and uh, 
in French with an English interpretation and uh, to make it an annual event. I want to thank our three French research institutes, the CIRAD, the INRAG, and the IRD for the expertise and the enthusiasm that they uh, contribute to the organization of this second edition. Um, this event is going to be more ambitious while uh, staying true to its initial concept and goal. Um, to reach both the general public and a more expert audience with the aim of promoting a culture of science. I also want to warmly thank uh, the, the experts of uh, the FAO, the IFAD and the World Food Programme for their uh, uh, contribution again this year to uh, this 2022 edition. Also, thank you to David Mer, a representative of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Thank you also to our uh, uh, piano player, uh, Timothy, who's uh, um, giving us uh, a few notes of joy and uh, tenderness. And also thank you to each and every one of you who's uh, um, with us from around the world. I would like to share a few uh, thoughts as uh, an introduction. This day is a day for uh, celebration. It has to be a day of freedom, of joy and curiosity uh, to celebrate this noble activity that is scientific research. Because science is a quest for understanding, understanding how things work, what the dynamics of our reality are and what kind of future they hold. <clears throat> and this quest is not just a contemplative quest. Um, it is uh, designed to help societies um, address the ch challenges and multiple crises they face. War, of course, war in Ukraine, but climate, biodiversity. Um, science also uh, has a mission of... Uh, forming a rational basis for public policy. And we will talk more about that in the second session of uh, this webinar. We will talk about also scientific foundations of initiatives such as Prezode 4 per thousand, which is a, an initiative for carbon capture. The Alliance for the Conservation of Rainforests or um, other coalitions that uh, were created uh, in the wake of this uh, UN Summit on Food Systems in 2021, such as the Agroecology Coalition or the School Meal Coalition. But let's stay realistic. Research cannot solve everything because our societies are complex. Political, economic, environmental factors are deeply intertwined as uh, the 2030 Agenda shows us very clearly. Research can also be wrong, and that's perfectly normal, because methods evolve, experimentation tools evolve. Scientists work with existing meaning in the present. Science is uh, carried out by human beings that can make mistakes and can be biased. Institutions and personal ethics uh, are acting as safeguards to ensure the integrity of research. Research should not be allowed everything. It um, must take into account ethical pr principles, for example, uh, preventing human cloning. As a conclusion, I would like to um, say that I strongly believe in the uh, utility of uh, science as a tool for people and the planet, and also the utility of scientific diplomacy, especially in the multilateral field, focusing on sustainable development because it calls for integrated and systemic approaches, which are at the core of the mandate and the action of the UN agencies in Rome. So without further ado, and uh, 
thanking you again for your attention and your uh, uh, contribution. I uh, thank Philippe Mauguin and Valérie Verdier, and I will now give the floor to Elisabeth Claverie de Saint-Martin um, for a, another introduction to the subject. So, Elisabeth, uh, you just come back from the COP27. So what are the uh, lessons that you've learned? Bonjour. Je sais pas si vous m'entendez. Oui. Euh, bonjour à I hope à, you can à... hear me. Hi everyone. Merci madame l'ambassadrice. Thank you madame ambassador for your introduction and for your implication. I am pleased to be with you on this science day and I really want to thank the embassy for this initiative and for all your personal commitment that um, shed lights on the work of our institutions, IRD, in RAE, and the institution I chair, Serad. Research institutions can be a key to better understand and find solutions to the main challenges about environment and food. In this framework, to me, Science Day is mostly a moment for dialogue, for a joyful dialogue because we talk of a party, but it's also a moment when researchers are going to, to listen to one another, to debate, on questions and preoccupations of civil society at a moment when we explain or uh, display works. Uh, it's true that there can be errors, there can be doubts, as Madame Ambassador said, and there is also a lot of work uh, still to be done. And our purpose is to speak to civil society and all stakeholders because this society is always a source for new scientific questions. Science Day, in my opinion, is also a moment when we try to work together and to engage together. Researchers need to accept to uh, stop using very technical words and open up to the others use normal words, the words of society, to go and discuss with people, with the words of others, with the words of policymakers, but also the words of citizens. And it's not always easy. But with it, for an institution such as Serab that works in more than 60 countries with so many cultures, so much richness and so many different questions, it's a big challenge. And this was why we wanted to have a, a science and society roadmap to emphasize how important dialogue was, how important uh, mediation and scientific broadcasting was, and also, of course, uh, scientific diplomacy. And in this roadmap, uh, this roadmap is going to be turned into an action plan in the following month. Researchers are going to share with you their research. I know they're going to be very humble and very patient, and I'm sure this will be very communicative. Some of them uh, are just back from COP27 and they're going to testify from what they saw, what they experienced, the kind of dialogue they could have with civil society. And some of them are also going to speak of the uh, preparatory uh, work that we're going, we are, we are doing for COP15. All this to show that we uh, really work to integrate citizens' preoccupations in our work. I hope these people are going to give you reasons to hope and to be optimistic. 
because science is here to set the framework of the discussion and to find solutions uh, eventually. Your participation in these discussions uh, all every day and here online is key because scientists and researchers have a shared purpose to serve knowledge. Uh, from the very first day where, when as a kid, you discover the world around you, uh, it's a very first seed of passion. And this passion grows and feeds uh, the, the will to know more about what surrounds you. This is what drives Serad and this is one of Serad's mission. Our mission is to fight great poverty and to fight for development with sustainable farming that can generate income for families. And we are here to listen to your questions, your comments and your requests, your challenging also. And all these are indispensable to our work. So with this word, I'm going to give the floor back to Raoul. I would like to thank you for being here and to thank all researchers who are going to be here with us and who are ready to answer any question you may ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we had uh, planned for a, a game to play with all of you. So um, maybe people that um, have followed the organization of this event will uh, have uh, an advantage. Uh, Léa and Louis Barthélemy, um, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear us? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, celebration of uh, science today. Um, you've come from 50 countries to hear us today from uh, all corners of the world. Um, International organizations also are with us today with 20 representations and uh, embassies and are with us. And so it uh, makes for a truly international day. Representatives of uh, the Food, uh, Agriculture and Organization are with us. Um, people from the uh, World Food Program, UPNUT and uh, UNESCO are with us. Uh, so representing agencies from the uh, United Nations. Also students and uh, NGOs. And we are grateful to have um, people from uh, various um, industries from agriculture, but also private sector. Television is uh, part of this day. Thank you everyone for your presence to this webinar. This is the proof that uh, researchers can meet uh, the general public and can uh, discuss and have a fruitful dialogue. Thank you. And we will now uh, launch the first session on the food uh, insecurity and crisis. Um, the um, facilitator for this session will be Robin Bourgeois, which is a CIRAD researcher in the Art Dev Mixed Unit of Research. And we will here are uh, five speakers, and then Sophie will ask questions. Uh, 
from the floor to the speakers. And so our panelists will have to give short answers um, to keep in time. Robin, the floor Thank is Thank you very much, Raoul. Uh, I am glad and it's an honor to facilitate this session live from uh, Senegal uh, in St. Louis on security and food crisis. Uh, today is a festive day, but the subject is serious. We talk of acute uh, food safety when somebody cannot eat proper food, which is endangering his or her life or livelihood. According to the last global report on food crisis, almost 1,993 um, million people in 53 countries were facing acute food security, uh, which is a record, and this record is only going to ag aggravate uh, with the years. The main reasons of this uh, aggravation uh, are three. Uh, uh, there can be conflicts, there can be extreme weathers, and there can also be uh, economic surge. And many, many times these factors combine one another and to make uh, the situations even more insecure. They impact uh, people's living and make prices, uh, the prices of uh, staple food grow. They also um, have an impact on accessibility and availability of food. Uh, other factors such as uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine have impact on uh, food economies and people's lives. The combining of these local and global shocks increases the lack of certainty in the face of food security. And this is also why we need to rethink the way we um, see the world, where we, the way we work, Sorry, I've lost, we've lost Robin. Yeah. So I was saying that we need to rethink the way we think and work. And for this, we need to, uh, to have more forward planning to explore the possible futures. And of course, I'm sure we will speak about it uh, more in future events. Uh, for what uh, we have today, we will be happy to have Sandrine Dury, who is an agricultural, agri-food and rural development economist in Serad. She, she works in uh, the Middle East and Balkans. We also have um, Jean-Christophe Ava, who is a molecular micro microbiologist in EcoBio, IRD. Uh, we will also have uh, testimonies uh, from researchers on uh, food insecurity. Uh, Akiko Suwa Eisenman, who is a researcher in INRAE and member of the high level panel expert executive committee. Um, and also, an, uh, it's an advisory board to the Committee on World Food Security. And we'll also have Denis Lacroix, who is an agricultural engineer with a specialization in tropical and Mediterranean aquaculture in uh, Ifremer. And uh, to finish, we will have Ronald Tranbahui, uh, uh, who is from the World Food Program, before having a few minutes for questions and answer. Please try and stick to the time you have to speak. And without further ado, I leave the floor to Mrs. Dury. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, stress was that food insecurity um, <laughs> is not increasing, not just because of uh, Ukraine or the COVID crisis, it has been on the rise again since 2017. And researchers from uh, several fields, when they come together, are able to uh, show that our organization between production, distribution, and processing, what we uh, generally call the food systems, 
are reaching their limits. And this is true everywhere. It is shown by multiple uh, studies. The um, HLPE, which is uh, linked to the uh, World Food Security Committee, um, and uh, many, many researchers have uh, come to that conclusion. The, the scientists um, despair because they feel they are not heard. Of course, we are not here to lead uh, policies, but uh, we are here to inform the debate. And in a time of uh, urgency such as this, um, researchers have the capacity to um, to give a more broader picture, to show you, for example, that uh, in a context of uh, rising international prices, uh, production is not a problem. We know how to produce enough food to to feed everyone, and especially intensive production like this uh, is damaging to the planet, to the environment. Um, 40% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are caused by farming today in the uh, conventional sense of the word with uh, agrochemicals. And so um, we are here to uh, think about the solutions as well as scientists. Scientists are not there to choose the right solution, but to uh, give us a range of options. <coughs> and for example, we know that uh, data from the FAO doesn't take into account food insecure people in developed countries. And food security is about having access to food. So one of the recommendations that uh, researchers can make, thanks to their different models and uh, various points of view, is that uh, we can uh, um, have an impact on the use of uh, the food production, because, for example, in Europe, half of the edible oils are currently used for agrofuels. Um, and, for example, we can switch from uh, cattle breeding to, to uh, cereal crops <laughs> to shift the production. Uh, the key is diversity, ensuring food security in the various uh, countries and territories um, should also be supported by um, a participative approach. And researchers also have a responsibility in that. Uh, as experts, we need to be involved in creating um, a common understanding and to help us uh, live better together. That's why we took part in multi-stakeholder initiatives to try and promote sustainable food systems. Um, we are going to talk more about agroecology in the rest of this webinar, so I will leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sandrine. We will now uh, move to um, Mr. Jean-Christophe Avar uh, to echo what Sandrine just said. Um, the different uh, institutes uh, gathered during um, uh, the conference to need uh, to lead a ref uh, carry out a reflection on how to change food systems, uh, all um, while protecting. Uh, the planet. Um, there are th three different crises in, uh, in, that are systemic in nature. 
the first crisis uh, in 27 28 was a crisis of uh of uh, offer because there was too many too much competition uh in food uh, research in 2020 it was um uh, a crisis of uh, demand because of sanitary conditions and there was no more uh, fertilizers for instance um weeds maize and corn and, and oils uh, uh is the third um crisis in 2021 2022 these three crises are directly linked directly linked to uh food production systems they push us to accelerate uh, the change the system change it's uh, climate and environmental emergency because it increases inequalities french research uh is working on changing food systems uh note uh, for instance with agroecology which we are going to speak of today we need to strengthen our investment on the long term by strengthening our cooperation with other partners decisions must not uh, question the long-term actions we've been carrying out food crises do not impact societies in the same way uh, people living in the south countries are not impacted in the same way there are gaps in food availability uh, and it's fundamental to meet these uh, demands we are working on local solutions with academic partners working with producers uh, but also with uh, national parks uh, managers, for example. Uh, the solutions need to be adapted to local context, and I'm going to cite uh, four concrete examples. The first is uh, strengthening uh, vegetal uh, plant proteins. Uh, we need to, uh, it's important to reduce uh, the consumption of water, of fertilizers. However, it is not as strategic in uh, sub-Saharan um, regions where meat consumption is far uh, lower than in Eastern Africa, for example. So the solutions need to be adapted to local uh, climate constraints and to the kind of cereals that grow there. Second solution is a, a revalorizing agro-pastoralism in dry areas. Uh, and animal breeding because animal husbandry is a way to bring animal protein to human and there's also a way to recycle nutrients and to fertilize uh, the soils it's also a, a way to favor short circuits short circulation product distribution products Agroecology is the third solution because it reduces the input of uh, chemical fertilizers and improves um, yields. The results can be very different. For example, in Madagascar, the approach is very promising, but in Cambodia, for example, it is quite mitigated uh, because local practices are very different. So we really go back to the idea of local context that needs to be taken into account to find the solutions. We also need to increase our engagement and our cooperation, creating mixed laboratories to share our knowledge, because only sharing knowledge is a way to, uh, will en enable us to find solutions. For example, the uh, plant protein plan is carried carried by friends uh, at an international level, but we also want to strengthen our partnership with international institutions with which we share the same vision and the same values. And last but not least, we consider that the role of women and youth is essential to the development uh, and to fight uh, food, in, um, food crisis. We'll now uh, move to uh, Mr. Takeko. Les crises actuelles de sécurité alimentaire montrent en effet 
de mon point de vue, combien il y a d'interdépendance dans la chaîne alimentaire. Et dans interdépendance, il y a dépendance et inter, c'est-à-dire entre, un lien. Et je vais structurer mon propos selon ces deux mots. Tout d'abord, les dépendances. Les crises récentes ont révélé un phénomène de concentration tous azimuts qui existe depuis quelques années et se sont intensifiés. Cette concentration génère de la dépendance. J'en donne trois exemples. Premièrement, la concentration des sources d'approvisionnement sur le marché mondial. En fait, beaucoup de pays gardent leur production chez eux et peu de pays l'exportent. Ainsi, l'Ukraine et la Russie sont plutôt de petits acteurs en termes de production de blé, mais sont de grands acteurs dans les échanges mondiaux, voire quasi les seuls pour une poignée de pays en Afrique et en Asie. Deuxièmement, concentration au niveau du transport. Il y a aussi un tout petit nombre de transporteurs maritimes et on a vu récemment combien un, un, un navire qui coinçait le canal de Suez arrêtait tout le commerce mondial. Troisièmement, concentration de la consommation. On consomme aujourd'hui principalement quelques céréales, blé, riz et maïs. La dépendance, cette dépendance est source d'instabilité quand une source d'approvisionnement est coupée pour un conflit, pour un choc climatique, une maladie des bêtes ou des plantes ou une crise économique. Comment réduire cette dépendance La solution, c'est de diversifier, diversifier les sources d'approvisionnement et diversifier ce que nous mettons dans notre assiette et diversifier aussi, euh, la, la, réduire la concentration aux mains d'un petit nombre d'entreprises en rétablissant la, des, la concurrence, en mettant par exemple des lois antitrust. Et maintenant, passons à l'autre partie du mot interdépendance, inter, le lien. Comme il a été dit, euh, notre, notre alimentation, ce n'est pas seulement de la production, euh, mais c'est aussi, au-delà des producteurs, d'autres acteurs dans la chaîne alimentaire, les acheteurs intermédiaires de gros, les vendeurs de détail, les banques, les transporteurs locaux, les transformateurs, voire les éducateurs qui euh, enseignent les bonnes règles de nutrition. Et les prix de l'alimentation humaine évoluent en fonction de ceux de l'alimentation animale et des biocarburants. En outre, au-delà de ce qui se passe à l'intérieur des pays, le commerce international a un rôle à jouer. Avec le changement climatique et la croissance démographique, en effet, certaines régions du monde seront en déficit alimentaire, c'est le cas des pays africains, et d'autres seront en surplus alimentaire, c'est le cas des pays européens. Le commerce international des pays en surplus vers les pays en déficit sera donc de plus en plus indispensable. Les solutions locales ne pourront pas tout. Donc, la sécurité alimentaire, c'est donc bien plus que la production. Le concept de sécurité alimentaire a évolué dans les années récentes en couvrant en non seulement la disponibilité, l'accès, l'utilisation et la stabilité, mais surtout désormais la durabilité environnementale et l'agencéité, c'est-à-dire pouvoir décider de ce qu'on mange, être maître de son destin. Et je voudrais insister sur ce point. La sécurité alimentaire, au-delà des angoisses, qui oppose riches contre pauvres ou producteurs contre consommateurs, c'est aussi un ensemble de décisions que nous pouvons tous prendre, chacun, les différents acteurs de cette chaîne alimentaire, dans un effort commun. Et les chercheurs participent à cet effort en informant les citoyens. Aujourd'hui, c'est dans cette fête internationale de la science et aussi dans ces interfaces sciences politiques comme le groupe d'experts dont je fais partie euh, auprès du Comité des Nations Unies sur la sécurité alimentaire. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, merci beaucoup Akiko. Et nous allons maintenant… Thank passer... you very much, Akiko. We'll now move to uh, the presentation of Denis Lacroix on questions that are quite close to what we work uh, in IRD on uh, food protection. Thank you, hi everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, cross scientific research and this uh, day for knowledge. About uh, fishery and aquaculture, there is an analysis. Fishery and aquaculture uh, provide for 18% of humanity proteins. Uh, and this stand for uh, thousands of mil uh, hundreds of millions of people who live from it. Uh, consumption increased a lot, 
uh, from around 9 kilos per year in 1960 to 21 kilos per inhabitant in 2021. And this trend is still on because the global population is still increasing. So uh, demand in uh, sea products is still increasing. Fishery is around 100 million tons. Uh, this is an average. Uh, uh, among which 20 million are for industrial fishing of pelagic fish to feed other fish and to create a uh, fish, uh, fish meal. We also have to add to take into account 15 to 20 million tons of illegal or undeclared fishing. What we observe is that uh, for the last 30 years, fishing is stagnating or even decreasing because three quarters of the stocks are exploited or over exploited and there is a very little leeway for growth. So we are now uh, reaching uh, the limits of uh, aquatic resources and it has impacts on a lot of species such as uh, mammals or uh, fish. Uh, about aquaculture, we account for 80 million tons of products that are mainly used for direct human consumption. Uh, many uh, uh, clear water fish, uh, uh, but uh, actual current development is more in salty water in sea with uh, floating cages in the sea. This growth is very rapid, uh, with around 2.5% per year, uh, whereas it's only 2.1% for the whole uh, food uh, area. There are still obstacles because uh, the environment is degrading, there are risks for uh, genetic pollution, uh, zoonosis, parasites, and also risks for image. Um, what about evolutions? When it is well controlled, the sector of fishery can stay, remain uh, sustainably productive at a good level, but there's always a risk for collapse in some uh, fisheries, and this for many causes. Uh, for example, in the Lion Gulf, uh, because uh, we dug in the ground, the size of plankton increased and um, technology can be helpful uh, to improve control and surveillance. Uh, we can also uh, use uh, um, uh, alternatives, for example, insects can uh, be used to feed fish instead of fish meals. And uh, last but not least, uh, the uh, increase of soil concentration in sea uh, has an impact on uh, a lot of uh, fishing areas, especially uh, low uh, coasts, uh, for example, in Egypt. Climate change has an impact on all aquatic um, uh, milieus, habitats. Uh, in quantity as much as in quality. So priority is to increase resilience of the of uh, these two sectors, aquaculture and fishing. There are three kinds of opportunity. The first kind of opportunity is international cooperation on research, on recirculating insect uh, meals, uh, plant meals, to diminish the pressure on fishing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second uh, opportunity is to rethink uh, the relationship between human and their territory, and the third uh, way, the third opportunity is to restructure. Um, the relationship between human, nature, and economy to have to see uh, see as a common good and a vital one. Thank you for this uh, music transition. Uh, uh, Denis stuck to his timing. And last intervention is Ronald. Uh, Ronald Henry, and he's going to give us a more cross-cutting uh, view. Hello. 
Um, Ronald, are you with us? So there may be a slight connectivity issue. So um, maybe, Roman, you can uh, uh, give us your um, impression on what we've just heard while Ronald is connecting. Yes, thank you, everyone, for uh, your contributions. And uh, it echoes what um, uh, Madame Ambassador and the CEO of CIRA just said uh, in the introduction. What we are trying to do as uh, researchers is uh, bring uh, uh, our views, but also our proposed solutions to uh, major challenges such as um, the food crisis. And this research takes place at uh, the very um, uh, um, local level up to the uh, um, worldwide issues that we all face. And um, this is uh, an action that we must take, not just only at uh, um, the leaders' level, but also uh, in the civil society. And for example, talking about food insecurity, we cannot uh, understand it fully if we don't take into account the, the way our societies are organized and the impacts that it has on food security. So, Raoul, if Ronald uh, cannot be with us, maybe we can have a longer Q&A session and uh, uh, give um, a bit more time to our speakers to answer uh, any questions that our public might have. Uh, Sophie, c'est à toi, et ensuite Robin va, va voir comment les distribuer pour qu'on reste dans les temps. À toi, Sophie, the floor is yours for asking questions. Uh, so, hi everyone, I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, my first question is to Mrs. Dury. It was asked on uh, the English chat, do you think that nowadays science and researchers prend en compte ce que disent les scientifiques et les chercheurs quand il s'agit de prendre des décisions politiques? Do we take into account researchers uh, as uh, when we take political decisions as far as food systems? I think yes, partly. And uh, we are frustrated because we would like uh, changes to come uh, quicker and to be more in the direction of our recommendations. But it is good that um, there should be political mediation because uh, there are many challenges. Uh, there's a lot at stake and uh, policy makers are here to mediate. But what we see uh, in our sectors are uh, attempts to redistribute land, to uh, change um, uh, food systems towards a more sustainable system. So yes, pol policymakers are listening researchers and they are also listening to voters and the voters sometimes listen to researchers and sometimes not. Um, and in many places in the world, there is dialogue between science and citizens. Uh, and the citizens are the ones who are going to put pressure on policymakers. Thank you very much, Sandrine. I would also like to ask the question to, um, to Akiko because of her function. Um, how do you see the relationship between research and uh, decision-making processes? Yes, I could testify uh, uh, from the expert group uh, of which I'm part. Uh, so we have uh, relationships that are based on the state of science and knowledge, because there are also knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge. 
And then there's very slow maturing, but if it's slow, it's good. Kivalento Vasano, we say in Italiano. Um, there's a dialogue between civil society and it ends up in um, um, in decision makings. And the governments and decision makers are very plural. It's not just uh, a question for the Ministry of uh, Farming, it's also the Ministry of Economy, of Industry, and all these people need to speak to one another. And it's uh, very complicated, even within a, one single country. Uh, can we move to the second question, Sophie? Yes, second question to Mr. Avar. Uh, based on your experience, how women and youth can contribute to the development of a better management of agriculture? Uh, I'll take a very basic example in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we see that women have uh, an important uh, role in production and processing of food, especially in small villages. So betting on an increase of women's role is really betting on success, a success for uh, village productions and short distribution circuits. Thank you, um, Jean-Christophe. Would anyone would like to speak now? Otherwise, uh, since we were just a few minutes late, we could uh, wrap up this session uh, because I'm, I'm sure there are many other questions. We will uh, try and answer, answer them uh, later uh, in, the in the next days, uh, give them a written answer. I'm th I think we're going to wrap up here. Uh, maybe uh, Ronald is here with us, but on YouTube, so he can't uh, speak now. So we'll uh, change subject. It was a serious subject, as you said uh, earlier. It was a difficult subject, human, human subject. But we're going to uh, take a brief, take a breath. And for this, uh, there's nothing better than a, a short session, a music session. So just 60, 60 seconds. Uh, live from London with Timothy. Voilà, c'est parfait. Perfect. We're now going to start the second session of this science day it's not less important than the first it's the name is science and society or sciences and societies it will be facilitated by Plat patrick flamayon who's the chief executive for executive ex expertise and support to public policies in inre so this is the perfect person to facilitate this session. I'm not going to prevaricate here and I'm going to hand over this mm, microphone to you so you can facilitate the session. And after, at the end of the session, Sophie will ask three questions from based on the comments and the chat. And just before this, we have a guest star from New York. Sarah, are you with us? I am here. Hi. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raoul, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, the, the two sessions um, are closely linked with uh, global challenges. Uh, we've uh, talked about this already, saying that uh, we face uh, very complex issues and um, public policy, whether uh, global, regional or local, uh, have a strong need for science. 
uh, as strong as it ever was. We need to co-construct solutions with researchers. We need collective uh, expertise uh, from uh, various fields of expertise. We need um, models, uh, world-class scientific publications, and um, intellectual capacities provided by um, the uh, science community and the academia to understand the challenge that we face. And <clears throat> this raised the question of uh, method, but also of ethics and uh, positioning of science. Um, it um, needs also that the scientific community share good practices uh, among themselves, but also with um, uh, project leaders. And I will now introduce our um, panelists for this session. So first, uh, and I hope he's with us, uh, let me introduce Ludovic Mollier, who is a uh, collective scientific expertise coordinator in the IRD expert mission. Uh, he uh, joined IRD in 2013, and he's now working on science and policy interfaces in IRD. And he's uh, a speaker um, for a collective expertise. He's also worked with INSEM and INRAE, uh, which are other uh, stakeholders involved in that uh, particular field of research. Hello, Patrick. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me fine. Yes, very good. You have five minutes. Thank you. So we can move to my presentation. Thank you. I'm really glad to be with you today to discuss uh, about the links between sciences and societies. I'm going to focus on collective science expertise, but there are all other institutes that use this kind of methodologies, such as INSERM, as Patrick said, CNRS, and of course, INRAE. What are collective science expertise? So quickly, it's a methodology that uh, uh, it may makes a link between uh, sciences and politics. Uh, we know IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, and there's also uh, IPBS for biodiversity, but there are limits to this. Um, these subjects are very complex and they need a cross-cutting approach. And this is why we tr try to make the most uh, applicable and operational recommendations as possible on uh, subjects that have uh, public interest. We work with ministries such as Ministry of Culture, of Health, of Research, and two examples of what we do um, is one from 2014 that was communicating by CBLC, so the uh, Lake Chad uh, development community that gathers the different communities living around Lake Chad. Uh, they wanted to ha to know what were the perspectives in terms of climate change. Is Lake Chad going to uh, dry out? And we work with a lot of experts to federate to an an analyze the situation of uh, a social environment uh, to make a social environmental analysis of the situation. Um, at the time, um, the idea was that the lake was going to disappear and dry out. And so many projects, many ambitious projects uh, were born for infrastructure. The expertise showed that it was not the case. Uh, with scientific facts, uh, the lake, we prove, proved that the lake was not going to dry out and it's still uh, true today. 
Uh, a mo more recent uh, example is uh, was made in 2021 on a small scale fishery in Haiti. It was co-founded by the American uh, Inter-American Development Bank and uh, the Minister of uh, Farming. In Haiti, one of the challenges is over exploitation of coastal resources and how to face uh, food security issues in the country. So the researchers that were involved in this program started an analysis on the environment, on fishery, aquaculture, to know what is possible or not, and um, uh, made different recommendations, very precise, on, for example, creating protected um, sea areas uh, with uh, the protection of reefs, the introduction of artificial re reefs, um, the change of the flotilla. It was very operational. We have around 15 such um, such uh, subjects uh, that are all publicly available on the IRD website. We've been doing so since 1993, and we all adopted these methodologies uh, really in the field. And I'm also, uh, I'd also like to discuss uh, the methodology itself and uh, how it is um, managed, what is the governance. Uh, the main two instance, um, instances are the expert college uh, that is made of around uh, 10 to 15 uh, scientists from different institutions, IRD, INRAE, or universities. We try to have um, uh, people from North countries, South countries, and also uh, be genderly, uh, gender uh, equal. And it's a way to have the most uh, comprehensive and scientific vision of the subject. And it's a very uh, collective approach. Uh, other very important instance is the follow-up committee that is made of uh, the client, uh, the one who asks for the research, and uh, stakeholders who are not scientists, so they are from outside. They give us an outside view, they see uh, that the language that is used is appropriate so that it can uh, really have have an impact um, with the right target and the right public. Uh, so this is, uh, as a whole, uh, an 18-month process <laughs> that starts with a, a launching workshop, there are a few meetings, uh, and there's a restitution meeting to create dialogue based on science to uh, give um, uh, ways to to help uh, decision making. And it's also a way to identify knowledge gaps to target the most specific research programs. Uh, the last slide shows you uh, our contacts, and we are uh, available if you have any questions. Thank, Thank you very you, much, Ludovic. Uh, uh, we work uh, with different national institutions uh, on these beautiful uh, methodologies, such as uh, collective very, expertise uh, major that topics. are very impactful uh, toward uh, public decision makers for, because um, they are based yeah, on, our on shared methodologies in, uh, and the they benefit from the strength of, of collective the methodology they're based on. It's hard to move from Sometimes it's difficult to scientific make the, publications um, to implementation between, um, by public policies. So behind this, we need and there is an interface. A need for interfacing. Uh, uh, and and this policy, interface is brought by different um, stakeholders, by, by different actors, uh, processes, uh, and I will invite uh, uh, David um, Mer. Uh, um, on that note, I would like to welcome Chief David Mer of the Concepts and Method um, Unit. 
uh, in the uh, European Commission, Joint Sensor Research. Uh, it's the internal scientific uh, department of European um, Commission. So as head of the concept and, and it works on needs, science for policy. And, uh, you're familiar with this uh, topic of science and policy. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And I will now talk about a document that we've just uh, published um, that uh, will be presented. Um, uh, European de recherche vont discuter comment on peut mieux organiser l'appui de la science uh, à la politique publique, qui est une question uh, qui arrive uh, vraiment au bon moment pour l'instant. Donc, prochaine slide. Donc, dans ce document, vous allez trouver so, cinq raisons. Uh, this slide shows you the five reasons uh, uh, to use science as a support for policy making. We are facing uh, complex problems that uh, were uh, that are um, on a scale that has never been seen before, and uh, we cannot solve those uh, issues without. Uh, using science on a, on a major scale. Um, it's important to have a science-based dialogue to inform our policies. And citizens are um, asking us for that, asking us for more uh, facts and science. At the European level, uh, we are um, uh, reviewing our um, processes uh, in how we take science into account in the, in the drafting of our regulations. Uh, throughout Europe, there is uh, there are several initiatives going on to strengthen the link between science and public action. So in all um, member countries, so and this is the initiative uh, that is taking place in Europe. We've uh, identified three main challenges um, in terms of uh, scientific expertise and um, information of public policy. There is a, a gap between um, uh, scientific institutes, uh, decision-making bodies, um, ministries, uh, official bodies, and other stakeholders at the public level. So uh, what we need to do is to build trust between the scientific fields and between um, public organizations. Uh, so maybe we need to um, to ask uh, what we call knowledge brokers to help interface science and public action. We also need to build uh, individual capacities by uh, building skills. Um, we need to learn how to uh, have a fruitful dialogue and uh, to um, help scientists speak to policymakers and vice versa. But it's not just a technical issue. We need uh, uh, to uh, have good practices in terms of governance for uh, how we use science in public policy making. Um, so, what we are um, proposing here to all member states, uh, 27 member states in the EU, are three types of support. Um, 
mechanism for building institutional capacities. We are working with the uh, European Commission uh, and a, a task force that is uh, in charge of uh, um, enhancing the uh, efficiency of the public administration. So uh, we are working on what they call their um, science policy ecosystem. We are also working at the individual level. We have uh, um, issued a framework for uh, professional uh, skills, uh, helping scientists uh, that want to um, be more involved in um, public policy making. So this um, competency framework is uh, designed to help scientists in that uh, regard. And also a third type of support that we um, propose is um, try and understand the um, the roots of science for policy ecosystems um, to understand why science and policy uh, often don't go hand in hand and to understand even at a philosophical level why that is. So um, the document was published on the 26th of October. Um, uh, the project launch uh, is um, uh, imminent, in, and uh, on the 2nd of December, as I said, it will be the first time that uh, um, ministers will be able to discuss uh, on that topic. Our report will uh, launch a series of reflections and initiatives in all member states. And because what we are trying to do is uh, uh, to take our um, concerns to the political level. So um, there are uh, a few questions I would like to put to you. Uh, do you agree with uh, our assessment? What is uh, missing? Uh, what is... Um, uh, the role of um, what is your role in supporting and uh, connecting science policy ecosystems in Europe? Can we speak about one system in a pay and in a country? Sorry, and how can the European Commission help member states? So these are the questions that uh, uh, can be used in this dialogue. Also, uh, last comment. Um, is stay in touch and contribute to uh, the debates at the European level. Uh, there's an online community and uh, you can write blog articles and share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, interventions. It was very inspiring for today's subject. The relationship between science and public policies can have ethical impact. Uh, they, there can be conflicts of interest. And for this, I will give the floor to Marie Delatre Gasquet. She is a researcher in CIRAD in the unit Actors, Resources and Territories in Development. Uh, she works on diversity in food systems, trust between civil society and science, and she's also a member of the um, ethics committee between INRAE, CIRAD, IFREMER, and IRD. Hi. Uh, Everything works. So, is ethic outside science, uh, can we make science without any ethical reflection? So it's a very tough question on a celebration day. It's a very important question. I won't answer it in five minutes, just 
Try to make you think about it. Ethics and science are two big words. Let's try to define them. What is ethics? It's not easy to answer a question on which philosophers have been reflecting for centuries. There are very different approaches from one culture to another. Ethics integrates interrogates the foundations and implication of a subject on which people have different targets, values, analysis that seem to be irreconcilable. It uh, is based on exchanges and crossing uh, um, visions to share uh, these different interests. It's a way to escape the irreductibility of contradictions. It's uh, the condition to a good life with and for others in the framework of fair institutions, as Paul Ricoeur said. Any human activity, including science, can raise questions and require ethical reflection. But what is science? Science is an organized activity for the acquisition and continuous improvement of acquired knowledge. It aims at describing and explaining the mechanisms that rule ourselves and the world that surrounds us. It aims at identifying and verifying the causal links that binds them. It also aims at gaining full understanding of the links, at using them, amplifying them and transforming them. Science is limitless because it always pushes the borders of knowledge. Science uh, is looking for truth. It's based on accuracy of the facts. It looks at the accuracy of standards. Research of truth can raise interrogations on values and on the way uh, science can help us and help a society. It can generate conflicts uh, so as the motivations of the partners, the publication of results, the methodologies to use and the consequences for human and animals and the environment on the short, medium and long term. Today, many citizens and researchers, especially young people, are inter uh, questioning science and want to rethink deeply research works. An ethical uh, and a cross disciplinary ethical reflection can help uh, policymakers and uh, leaders to take the fair decision and make the right choices. It raises questions that have not been seen and uses other criteria than just economy. It questions uh, different ways, alternatives. For example, um, cons the Consultative Ethics Committee of INRAE uh, was asked to uh, a question uh, new tools such as the genetic improvement of plants and animals, for example, genome editing by CRISPR, that could bring a solution to the 21st century's challenges, for example, climate change, bioeconomy and biodiversity. And it expressed two views. Another example, knowing that uh, broadcasting the results at a very fair and broad um, way is a way to uh, prevent, uh, well, to help production and to help infrastructures and to fight nepotism. Uh, and UNESCO, for example, wanted to, uh, uh, to have uh, an equal access to all vaccines and medicines that were developed against uh, COVID-19. I hope I have uh, convinced you uh, in the, how important ethics were to have. It was it was important to have a, an ethical reflection on science uh, before starting uh, uh, work. Ethical reflections are not um, an obstacle to progress. They are a sine qua non condition to progress. I invite you to go and uh, look for um, all these research of the think tanks about ethics, for example, the uh, Comité Éthique en Commun has produced a lot of reflections on this. There are a lot of reflections on uh, science and ethics. 
and our committee would be glad to uh, to think deeper and to think with other organizations from the UN or other scientific partners. I wish you a very uh, a pleasant uh, science celebration. Thank you very much. Uh, because uh, uh, ethics and science can be a very difficult um, uh, question. And to move to another subject, I will uh, invite Sarah Savastano, who's uh, a chairwoman of uh, IFAD. Uh, her experience is very rich and diversified in World Bank, in the Roma University, uh, Vergata and also um, the um, uh, sorry the Italian Ministry of Economy and Finance until uh, 28. Sarah, the floor is now, now yours. Um, thank you, Mr. Flammarion. Thank you, Raoul, for inviting me. I hope uh, I will be able to uh, share my presentation. Um, I will be very brief, but um, I want to talk to you about what I've uh, gathered from the uh, all the interventions that we've heard so far in the second session, but also in the first session. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to share my screen now. I hope you will be able to see it. And... I want to talk about the bridge between science and uh, policy, uh, policy making. Um, this is a broken bridge. Uh, and for now, we are uh, not managing to, um, to repair the bridge. And in the last 10 years, the uh, public policy makers have been um, producing um, um, summaries of uh, policy action to inform their future decisions. Um, in 2015, uh, we created the Sustainable uh, Development Goals to try and inform public policy and this is why um, scientific summaries are um, more de needed than ever because scientists had to uh, summarize and um, and explain uh, what the state of things is in science to help uh, decision makers in their work. This is really difficult to use the results of scientific studies to um, uh, for public policy making. Um, what we are aiming at is to uh, promote the evidence-informed policy-making process, uh, meaning that uh, we want to base our uh, action on uh, proven evidence. So, uh, to say it in, in a simple way, uh, we have producers of information and science and consumers of science. So, uh, producers uh, in the broad sense, um, professors, students, uh, research institutes, uh, it's true for agriculture, but also for development and the economy, I would say. And also institute as uh, CIRAD, IRD, etc. But also on the other side, consumers, uh, 
uh, such as um, um, international organizations, but also donors, um, private sector, including multinationals, uh, but also small and medium enterprises, uh, civil society organiza uh, organizations, NGOs. So all those consumers um, are um, on one side of the river and the producers are on the other side of the river and the bridge between them is broken. Why is that? Because they don't speak the same language. They have uh, different objectives. They have uh, optimizing uh, behaviors that are diverging. Um, uh, incentives are different, the quantity and quality of information they um, need is different, and also the, the, the knowledge and professional experience of um, public, uh, policy makers and uh, information producers is different. So what can we do to, uh, to bridge that gap? We need a third agent. We need a translator of science, uh, someone who is able to, um, to build a bridge between producers and consumers of science. We need to encourage and promote collaboration between science and policy, and we need to bridge the gap uh, in terms of communication. We need to integrate science-based elements in um, public policy making, and we need to prepare policy makers um, to give them the expertise that they need to understand research and um, knowledge summaries. So what are we doing in the uh, IFAD uh, in terms of uh, integrated databases? Uh, sort of the IFAD is the International Fund for Agricultural Development. We are uh, promoting uh, projects that are uh, consistent with our, with our goals. We are funding um, impact assessments with a strong methodology to uh, assess the impact that FIDA projects have on uh, our beneficiaries and society as a whole. We are working with uh, uh, local stakeholders, <clears throat> people in charge of uh, managing the portfolio of our operations, and we are uh, trying to um, conduct these impact assessments at the beginning and the end of our projects, trying to build on the knowledge that we have and to, um, to understand what's uh, been happening, what are the positive outcomes, but also the lessons that we can learn uh, from what didn't work. Um, and uh, to do that, uh, it's also to uh, improve future projects. Thank you. également et qui sont, je trouve, très convergents avec ce qu'a pu nous présenter David Mer du GRC de la Commission européenne. Donc, je. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this uh, very interesting input. It's uh, consistent. Ludovic also brings us very uh, concrete solutions. Uh, it shows that even if we still have to make progress uh, in how uh, 
to discuss between civil society and science, there are already good practice on which we can base um, processes. Uh, there may be questions. So Sophie is going to uh, uh, to share the questions, but we will uh, answer this question, uh, uh, bring a written answer to these questions because we don't have time to discuss them. First question is how French institutes uh, uh, use this uh, collective expertise in international instances when there's no specific recommendation. The second question is about how important field data are, what are the obstacles uh, for uh, data collection, and how do you guarantee that data collection gives uh, the opportunity to speak to people who are really uh, concerned by uh, the matter. We will now move to the third session to try and stick to our program. So we have reached uh, our third session. It was a challenge per se. Uh, and the third session is innovation and sustainability in our plates. Because we thought that uh, because we have our uh, celebration at uh, the hour for lunch in Paris and Roma, our four interventions uh, will try and discuss in their way uh, about innovation and sustainability in our plates. We'll speak from infinitely small of robotics um, of the microbiome. Uh, which is a way to change our gaze on health, on how we look at, look at health, environment, and agriculture. We'll speak of agroecology uh, that uh, is a crossroads of questions. Uh, and uh, last subject is about water, because without water, there's no good wine, as Francois Rabelais would say. And we'll have uh, another uh, intervention on this subject. We have four interventions. And then uh, uh, Leticia Mango from Brazil will uh, react to these four interventions and she will uh, uh, be helped by her fellow researchers from Indon Indonesia, Italia, Zimbabwe, Benin, Cameroon, and Nepal. We'll start with uh, Véronique Belon morel who uh, is the first woman, uh, women uh, uh, awarded on spectrometry, infrared spectrometry, uh, use in farming and environment uh, issues. Donc effectivement, je suis Véronique Bellon Morel. Je suis actuellement chef adjointe du département Matnum à Inrae, et je dirige un institut qui s'appelle Digitag, qui est dédié à de la recherche interdisciplinaire. So hi um, everyone, I'm Véronique Bellon Morel. Um, I'm working um, in Erstra, and today I will talk uh, to you about the um, contribution of robotics to agriculture. So, um, first, let uh, me just remind you that uh, um, agriculture, of course, uh, as every um, aspect of life, is impacted by major challenges, uh, climate change, Loss of biodiversity, loss of attractivity of the jobs, uh, digital transition and food transition. And uh, what we need is to innovate in uh, agriculture and uh, uh, food production to address the threats and uh, uh, size opportunities, uh, seize opportunities, sorry. So, um, Talking about digital and robotics and what uh, they can bring to agriculture, um, the idea is to collect data on the field and to um, analyze the data, um, make it actionable. 
So, um, and the idea is to produce better, to uh, reconnect um, agriculture and consumers, and to increase capacities. But those um, um, solutions uh, are not uh, the solution. They have to be used um, and combined with more systemic solutions. They have to benefit small uh, farmers and to be uh, integrated in a mix of um, combined innovation. So, for example, uh, to take the pillar, uh, uh, produce better, um, digital tools can help us um, observe what's happening on the field, help um, make an assessment or diagnosis, and help uh, uh, in decision making. Uh, so, in the past, man has invented the field to make work easier, and now we are using robots, robots to uh, help with repetitive or difficult tasks, such as uh, um, uh, taking out weed or um, milking. <clears throat> the robots can also help uh, reduce the impact of uh, certain activities. And uh, they can help um, implement a strong agroecology, uh, for example, pixel crop. Um, in terms of uh, social and cognitive capacity building, um, digital tools can help uh, share um, information uh, to connect with each other, but it all can also be a tool for learning and innovation, so uh, remote learning and also uh, collective experimentation. It's a way to reconnect to the market uh, through uh, short distribution circuits, <clears throat> robots that can uh, collect data on the way we produce food. Uh, can be used to feed the applications that the consumers use when they uh, decide what to shop. And the question that we have to uh, ask ourselves is, can we imagine a digital solution and a, a robotic solution for each type of agriculture. Yes, uh, as there are many types of agriculture, there will be many types of uh, digital solutions. And uh, this is what we discuss uh, in our um, white paper, uh, Agriculture and Digital. Um, and the research has to um, be uh, cross-disciplinary, uh, it has to be open, it has to be international. Uh, for example, we are sharing uh, initiatives with the FAO and the EU. And uh, this webinar is a perfect example of collaboration. Le superbe PowerPoint n'est pas passé en tout cas sur notre chaîne, mais il a Thank été. Thank you very much, Véronique. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't see your PowerPoint presentation, but the message was very clear, and we are going to share your presentation afterwards uh, in a few days. Um, I will now move to Joël Doré, who also has a PowerPoint, and he's going to speak of um, digestive and food ecosystems. Uh, he works on Mad Pharma, uh, New Biome, and GMT. 
And I'm afraid uh, after his presentation, we won't have a look at our plates in the same way. Thank you, um, Raoul, for this uh, introduction. My target uh, is to illustrate how science can bring opportunities for uh, health prevention and uh, the, the health of planets. So, the biodiversity of living systems is uh, an essential uh, issue in one health, in global health, uh, because our health depends on the health of microbiomes. We focus on Homo sapiens health, uh, but we need to be aware that microbes uh, were on Earth far before humans. Human and microbes ecosystems are permanently uh, in symbiosis and interacting with billions of bacteria and human cells. And they are permanently in contact with the external um, world uh, from the respiratory system, the stomach, the urogenital tract, intestines and skin. Uh, in the the sixth extension and unnatural history, Elizabeth Colbert says that we are deciding without meaning to which evolutionary pathway will remain open and which will be forever closed. Um, but there's also an extinction that is invisible, is the extinction of uh, the wealth of our microbiomes. The change of our uh, lifestyle and food leads to a reduction of 50% of uh, our uh, microbiome richness. In spite of considerable progress of medicine that made possible the control of infectious diseases, uh, it led to uh, where well, our way of life led to uh, the increase of chronic diseases and complications. Uh, WHO predicts that uh, in 2025, one person out of uh, four will be uh, concerned by uh, diabetes or other chronic disease. We feel that uh, nutrition and environment are separate issues, but they are not, uh, they are interrelated. Uh, life expectancy is even starting to decrease, and this is already uh, observed today in the United States of America. Um, our lifestyle reduces um, the diversity of our diet, and this leads to uh, a reduction of fiber, which are um, a source of diversity in our bowels. In many uh, diseases that are related to nervous system, liver, metabolisms, science describes an alteration of the symbiosis between human and these microbes. This is a vicious circle that can be fed in uh, with time. Um, the four uh, types of action that we may have to help is prediction, prevention, and therapy. But to be more optimistic, nutrition helps us uh, good solutions. Uh, uh, um, we can reduce heart diseases uh, by the way we eat, for example, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean um, diet decreases heart diseases and reduce by 20% uh, precocious uh, mortality. Following nutritionists' recommendations is also a way to protect the planet because nutritionists' recommendation and um, uh, ecology experts' recommendations uh, are the same. We have 
a converging uh, it's too fast there's an emergency to act uh, the vicious cycle of uh, alteration of uh, symbiosis between human and humans and their internal uh, microbiome is linked to uh, how we relate to our planet. We need to rethink food systems uh, by thinking uh, in a microbiome friendly and in a planet friendly way. I really thank you for your attention and I invite you to take care of your microbiome. Thank you very much, uh, Joël. Thank you. Joël Doré. Uh, I will now give the floor to Laurent Cournac. Uh, it's the turn of uh, Laurent, Laurent Cournac, Cournac from IRD. Uh, became director uh, became of the Functional Ecology, the bio functional ecology and Biogeochemistry of Soils and Agrosystem um, in 2019. And uh, you're also working on agroecology. And so, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Um, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, let's um, uh, let's begin. So, yeah, about agroecology or agroecologies. Uh, of course, it's um, um, it's a concept that has multiple meaning. The, um, def sorry, the definition of agroecology is uh, to design production systems that are uh, uh, using the uh, advantages of ecosystems. And if you want to know about the advantages and functionalities of ecosystems, to use them, we need to know them, to recognize them. So uh, that's why we need scientific research. Um, we also need to inform uh, practices and uh, we also need to provide a framework for those practices to be uh, implemented and uh, so that's why we need governance and social engagement and uh, the three dimensions here um, all have one thing in, com in common, sorry, is the um, sustainability of uh, food and uh, agri-food systems. The idea is to um, work in a systemic manner and to take uh, multiple dimensions into account. Um, and uh, different organizations have worked on this concept but for example, the FAO has uh, identified 10 um, basic principles of agroecology. And those 10 um, funding principles um, show that uh, if we want to do better in terms of production, recycling, etc., we need to um, collaborate. We need to um to leverage uh, local uh, expertise and skill we need to uh, promote a social and um, uh, social economy and this in turn will help achieve the goals uh, of the sustainable development goals that so uh, were funded by the um, UN like uh, the agroecology is not, um, a miracle solution. It is a transition to more sustainable um, farming systems and food production systems. And um, depending on the, where we start, where, where the starting point is, uh, we will have a different uh, um, has to take, uh, whether we uh, start from a subsistence agriculture or an industrial agriculture, this transition will take different forms. <laughs> Scientific challenges are uh, numerous and uh, 
they relate to um, the science of ecological systems. So understanding the processes, the natural processes. Uh, for example, here uh, we have two different systems. Uh, an intensive one and a, a more traditional one. The problem is that uh, uh, in the um, intensive system of production, we uh, realized that um, um, there was a, a loss of uh, biodiversity, but also a loss of production due to parasites. And this is something that does not ha uh, happen in traditional systems. So what, uh, what we uh, suggested here uh, to solve the issue was to reintroduce uh, uh, auxiliary plants and, uh, and it's forced us to understand the interactions between all um, um, plants and animals in that production system. <laughs> and um, this uh, is a way also to try and understand uh, how to um, support production and uh, soil fertility. The second aspect that is um, relating to agroecology is uh, agronomy. So the practices and uh, maybe innovative practices. The idea is to co-design uh, locally um, suited systems, um, integrating local knowledge, and to assess in a multi-dimensionary uh, way the, uh, the impacts. And the idea is to conduct a multi-criteria analysis to do that. And the third um, the third field is, of course, uh, human social sciences to assess uh, the economic and so social impacts. <clears throat> so understanding processes, uh, understanding practices, uh, uh, innovating and taking into account economic and social systems is paramount. And um, last but not least, we need to uh, encourage uh, international initiatives, and those are a few here. And uh, we also need increased fundings from our organizations, our governments, to uh, keep um, going forward. And so it's important for the development of agroecology. Uh, Laurent, you have 15 seconds to explain this uh, uh, metaphor here. So this is uh, the street lamp. And uh, the question is to, uh, for example, if someone is uh, has lost his keys and trying to find uh, um, their keys under the street lamp, then they have a limited uh, research area. The idea is to broaden the scope and um, to, to get out of your comfort zone, to, um, to get on the field, to see what's happening for real, and uh, try to inform the transition of food systems through agroecology, because um, you very we are very running much, out Laurent. of time. We're going to move to water with Marie-Laure uh, Vercambre.
uh, you've been uh, working in many uh, entities such as the World Water Forum in Dakar a few months ago, the uh, World Conservation Congress, and you will be also in New York in 2023. Uh, we are not... I, I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, it's true that our partnership, uh, the French partnership on water, is I'll just give you a, a bit of context. It's an organization, a French organization that is made of all the main stakeholders on the water, ministries, uh, on environment, uh, cities, associations, research centers, and also companies. And among our members, we are pleased to have INRAE, to have uh, the water unit in CNRS. We have the new uh, Montpellier uh, UNESCO chair, many schools such as AgroParisTech, and together, uh, so our mission, uh, we are a multi-stakeholder platform and our role is to advocate uh, the challenges around water. Uh, what I was expected to do today was to enlarge to um, other subjects and to give you a perspective uh, on uh, non-scientific um, areas. We try to be part of uh, on climate cups uh, because it's important for agriculture and food. And uh, so what do we do? Well, for example, uh, we uh, are part of the IPCC report. We also prepare the first water conference. <laughs> it's the first United Nations water conference that is going to be organized in 2023, in March. And we will prepare for it with a certain numbers of roundtables, interventions, a gathering many countries. And one of the main interventions uh, during the preparatory meeting in October was that uh, it was an intervention from the International Science Council uh, asking that for um, that we get scientific data on uh, clear water. And uh, I would like to go back to an interesting matter, because if you want to reach uh, uh, sustainable development goal number six on fresh water, uh, water is a very cross-cutting issue. It's uh, also in sustainable cities, on health, etc. The challenge is that the United Nations, because they noticed we were very far from reaching the sustainable development go uh, goals, especially number six, one of the actions is uh, collecting accurate data and information. Of course, science is not uh, omnipotent, uh, and uh, maybe our research works have don't have enough impact, but there are five leverage of acceleration, one of them being improving uh, data and information. There's also another leverage, which is governance, very important, funding sources, uh, strengthening capacities, and innovation. And for all these leverage, um, science is fundamental. So yes, I wanted to insist on these aspects saying that our advocacy work is based 
is scientifically scientifically based and researchers universities have a lot of work to contribute that science be part of our lives and of advocacy thank you very much marie laure no transition and i'm giving the floor to leticia She's a young agronomist in Caen University, Normandy, in INRE. As a young researcher, she works on the effects of global warming on field crops, especially through modeling. She represents the youth, a uh, young scientist group. Um, and she will comment freely on what she heard, asking questions uh, that you try it together so you have a few minutes uh, for presentation and for questions you're free it's yours leticia um great thank you thank you hi everyone thank you raul for this introduction and uh, the invitation as well i'm very happy to be here today for the uh, um, celebration of science uh, on behalf of the young young scientist group and um, I'm glad uh, to wrap this session uh, that is full of uh, very interesting insight. Uh, thank you, Véronique Bellon-Morel, for uh, um, highlighting uh, new solutions for digital uh, integration. As Raoul uh, said, I'm working with the uh, model myself on, uh, in agriculture, and uh, it has been interesting to see in the last few years <laughs> the evolution and the trends in that uh, industry. Uh, the first trend is uh, the implementation of um, new technologies by um, uh, by experienced users and, uh, and farmers, but also new joiners. People um, are integrating more and more technology in their work. In, and this is really interesting. The second thing is the structuration of action to support those initiatives, for example, uh, technical trainings, but uh, also network uh, for sharing data and uh, especially the uh, projects uh, for increased collaboration between uh, science and the private sector. Um, thank you uh, also to Joël Doré for his presentation on microbiomes uh, because uh, it's so complex and uh, it's uh, really interesting to have this holistic approach. Um, in everyday life, I would say, or in the, in the common sense, we um, tend to consider microbiomes come, uh, as a um, as a source for uh, problems, uh, but it can be seen as a solution. So thank you about that. Thank you, Laurent Cournac, uh, on uh, your very clear message on uh, agroecology as an agronomist. Uh, in the current context, um, it seems to me that it is uh, um, impossible to imagine that uh, to take um, production and consumption issues separately. So it's really interesting uh, to um, explore new ways of producing food, but also new ways of engaging uh, new generations in supporting those uh, sustainably tools to problems. And uh, uh, last but not least, thank you, uh, Mrs. Vercamb, for uh, your insight on water, which is a very important issue. Um, availability and quality of water is paramount and has been uh, increasing in the last years. For uh, young people like us, uh, 
it's reassuring to see that uh, action is being taken by the um, involved stakeholders. And um, as a young researcher, a, a message that I would like to get across um, is an appeal for new generations that are uh, open to new tools and innovation. Uh, we have a responsibility to um, take ownership of those tools to, to enhance and promote the transition to more sustainable food systems. And uh, we have to see what the impacts will be on the uh, medium and longer term. I uh, want to thank you on behalf of our young scientist groups. And one or two questions? Uh, well, I'm sorry because we are running out of time. So again, we will uh, collect all your questions. Uh, you can put them in the chat and we we will make a, a written answer to the question. Thank you. Um, it's 35 past two. Um, in France, we are um, running out of time, but... Uh, Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Dernière session, 2030. So, last session. So, 20. Tomorrow, 2030. I won't go into details. Each uh, speaker is going to uh, speak for themselves. Uh, they are going to wrap up this uh, celebration of science. Uh, so we'll start with Evelyn Sawadogo Compaore. She'll speak from Ouagadougou. Uh, she's uh, awarded by the uh, Pan African Awards. Uh, she joined the National Center for Scientific and Technologic Research in Burkina Faso in 2015, and her Institute for Environment and uh, Farming Research. Uh, she is uh, has a passion for transition and transformation on the long term. Thank you for sharing with us your reaction to the first uh, sessions and also give you what is for you tomorrow in 2030. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to uh, participate in this celebration because I think uh, that uh, celebrating science is a way to transform the world. My uh, presentation will uh, be structured around two main uh, aspects. The, the question of interdependency in a global context of um, meeting the challenges we face, um, requiring the intervention of international organizations, but also other institutions that those actors have uh, been making efforts to um, support the dynamics at the level of the different countries, especially in Africa. And I think this is a first step. This is a first victory. And with agroecology and foresight, we are, um, um, we are driving change. And this is a good thing. To me, the, the process cannot uh, go on without solidarity. Uh, the global level and local level have to um, be connected through to the regional level as well. And um, we were happy to contribute to a number of initiatives um, 
and partnerships between uh, northern and uh, north and south countries, but also with uh, uh, Europe, European Union member states, um, talking about uh, food security, curbing carbon emissions, agroecology, all those issues are um, closely linked. Um, there are causes and consequences, and so it's important to consider them together. And in the future, if science is able to um, give relevant answers to those challenges, um, it will help the world. And uh, looking to 2030, we have to stay optimistic. We have to maintain our current level of effort and to um, to support local solutions. Local initiatives are um, conducted in a spirit of solidarity between countries. The idea is to drive global action through local initiatives. Because if there is no synergy of action at the global level, local initiatives will stay disconnected and uh, will not uh, yield enough results. And our governments need to act to support that uh, that evolution. We need to build on the existing solidarity between uh, research, um, international development, and keep supporting local initiatives to um, reduce carbon emissions, for example, or to develop agroecological systems. The, the results of those initiatives will um, happen in the longer term. And we have a responsibility to support the process. And I don't want to say we can be optimistic. I want to say we must be. We must be optimistic because the states that are facing challenges at the national level will be able to uh, do something through public policy, helping their uh, communities and, and uh, society. And so global initiatives have to be translated at the national and local level. In 2030, uh, the world will be better and science will uh, play an increased role. And we are on track to make the world better and especially in Africa, where the impacts are uh, 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 significant. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, and uh, now, Philippe Mogan, you're uh, the CEO of INRAE since uh, 2023, in the wake of the merger between INRA and IASTA. Uh, you we're also cabinet director to minister of agriculture in France, Stéphane Lefort. I am sure that uh, everything we've heard so far uh, is uh, echoing by you, especially uh, when we talk about 2030, which is a, a key uh, milestone for the year. Um, 
UN 2030 agenda, but also for the uh, INRAE strategy. So uh, let's hear about uh, your longer term perspective. Thank you, Raoul. Hello, everyone. I am glad to discuss with you. It's a very, it's a great exercise. Of course, I can't uh, answer all these questions, Raoul, but I really measure uh, the, all the efforts that have been made in collaboration among the whole scientific uh, community in agronomy, environment, uh, health, uh, all the efforts that have been made with FAO uh, since the time when I was working with uh, the French Ministry for Agriculture, Stéphane Le Foll. Um, he contributed to uh, the awareness raising by civil society uh, on uh, how important agroecology was. Agroecology is not um, a target, it's a means to reach sustainable food. What we have is a community around this target. It's very cross, uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, different interventions. Uh, it's always very frustrating to have so little time to share uh, your work, but it's just sharing small, win opening small windows on ongoing researches, and it shows how consistent these very different researches are with one another. Um, it shows that agroecology is nurturing on uh, water researches or feeding on microbiome researches uh, on the digital, because it shouldn't be opposed or forgotten uh, from our research. We know that the digital um, transition has a decisive role if we want to have impact we need to collect information and data and need to be able to to master this data so we we showed i think uh, during these different presentations that we showed a beautiful image of how engaged the different scientists are I also liked uh, the interaction with youth. So thank you, Leticia, and uh, and uh, and the group of uh, young scientists. Um, it's very pleasant to see uh, young researchers, uh, doctors, who are going to uh, to study um, further or not. Uh, we had serious presentation, but it's the, these presentations showed a shared ambition, a shared optimism in a spirit of celebration. Last year, uh, we spoke in the name of the three establishments created by INRAE, uh, and I really want to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Céline Jorgensen, uh, Ambassador, because she uh, launched uh, the, the edition. We talked of the Great Green Wall. And this year, uh, our colleagues from CERAD contributed a lot to the organization of the event, so I really thank them. We, this, the, they were uh, uh, very decisive in the choice of speaking of food crisis. And our colleagues from IRD will be in charge of next uh, science celebration. Uh, and all this is a, an illustration of how science works, science at the service of impact, at the service of citizens. We showed that uh, there is progress and there are even more expectations in the face of these progress. So it's a challenge um, adapting our agriculture systems, uh, adapting our food systems to uh, meet, um, uh, to find solutions for sustainable futures. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, uh, Raoul, for orchestrating uh, this great event. And I would like to uh, meet you later on for other uh, uh, interventions. 
Thank you very much. Uh, before the final music show, uh, we'll uh, have a Fred Meninder leader. So, Fred Leader, you're a chief scientist uh, for FAO. You've worked on designing the very first uh, science strategy for office. In French, we have a very nice phrase saying, the exception confirms the rule. So you are the exception of this science day because you are going to speak Shakespeare's language. You have nothing against Moliere's language, but uh, we wanted to uh, uh, greet our English-speaking um, uh, public by having an English intervention. And you have five minutes. Merci beaucoup, Raoul, and greetings all. It is my great pleasure to be here and speak with you today. Now, first of all, let me congratulate Raoul, the organizers, all the speakers, and the audience that have been following today's event online. And I want to really extend a special thank you to Letitia, the World Food Forum Young Scientist Group representative, who jumped in to contribute at the last minute. Now, we heard today also, and we all know that decades of development efforts around the world have shown that narrow approaches and technological quick fixes do not work, especially in the long term. Science and innovation can be a powerful engine to transform agri-food systems and end hunger and malnutrition, but only when they are accompanied by the right enabling environment, as has been emphasized by various speakers today. Also, not all solutions require technology or innovation, although the approaches could be innovative in the use of behavioral and social sciences to bring about change. Now, all that we've heard today resonates really well with me. Indeed, uh, science and innovation have always been a part of FAO's work, but now we are looking to step up our efforts given the urgency of the many different complex and interlinked challenges that agri-food systems face today. Now, Raul mentioned FAO's first ever science and innovation strategy that was endorsed by the FAO Council in June this year. It's a key tool to support the delivery, not only of the FAO strategic framework 2022-2031, but also the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This strategy is grounded in seven guiding principles, including one of them being ethics-based. We talked about that earlier, and has three mutually reinforcing pillars which define its main priorities. And these pillars are strengthening science and evidence-based decision-making. The second one is supporting innovation and technology at the regional and country level, and finally, serving member countries better by reinforcing FAO's capacities. And there are also two enablers for this strategy, which are transformative partnerships and innovative funding and financing. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a couple of recent initiatives that we've been working on. The first one is the Agri-Food Systems Technologies and Innovations Outlook, or ATIO, as we are calling it for short, a new knowledge product that will become a biennial flagship FAO publication and is a direct outcome of the science and innovation strategy. And the objective of this outlook is to curate the existing information on the current measurable state of science, technology, and innovation for agri-food systems, as well as upcoming changes and their transformative potential to inform evidence-based policy dialogue and decisions, including on investments. And it'll supplement this valuable data curation with horizon scanning, foresight, and also synthesis of the available evidence on their impacts. The second initiative I wanted to briefly mention is now the work that FAO is doing with respect to technologies such as gene editing. We are working on an issue paper on gene editing techniques and agri-food systems and this paper is intended to be science and evidence based and should be published in the next two or three weeks. Now, FAO's commitment to global discourse on gene editing, it represents a continuation of its policy to represent a neutral platform for discussion of potential benefits 
and risks of technologies in terms of consequences for human hunger, human health, animal welfare, food safety, effects on the environment, socioeconomic impact, and the distribution of benefits. Last month, we successfully held the FAO Science and Innovation Forum, which many of you attended. And that focused on highlighting the centrality of science, technology, and innovation for agri-food systems transformation. Not only that, it also encouraged a diversity of discussions based on science and facilitated the rationalization and inclusiveness of the debates. Now at this forum, we also celebrated the renewal of a memorandum of understanding between FAO and the three major French research institutes for rural and ag development and the environment, CIRAD, INRE, and the IRD. Now FAO and the three French research institutes have a long standing and a very strong commitment to cooperate for co-developing knowledge, expertise, capacities, and innovations in a large range of thematic areas that we also talked to about today, ranging from water, soil, agroecology, biodiversity, and digital technologies. Uh, going forward, under the umbrella of the science and innovation strategy, our ambition is to further strengthen these synergies between the FAO experts and researchers from French research institutes for foresight, for science and evidence-based policymaking, and other areas where we can cooperate to transform agri-food systems and achieve a world without hunger. And once again, before I hand it back to Raoul, thank you for a very productive and very engaging presentations today. Back to you, Raoul. Thank you very much, Prit. We're now reaching the end of this Science Day edition 2022, and I'm giving Valérie Verdier, president of IRD, the honor to close today's session, uh, the, the session uh, tomorrow, 2023, uh, 2030, sorry, and uh, taking us to um, the next agenda. Because if you, as if you understand well, uh, we will have this uh, celebration every year. Twenty thirty seems to be a long time away, but it's very close from us. Our knowledge of ecology, biodiversity, and uh, how ecosystems work will be a way to uh, uh, learn how. We can use time and build a sustainable future, and we'll be listening to Valérie. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and also a form of sadness to uh, already close this uh, second edition of uh, International Science Day. Uh, we can already say that it's uh, a great success and I'd like to express my thanks to Raoul and to all uh, those who were involved in the organization of the event and who contributed to this success. Thank you to Prit Lider uh, from Science and Innovation Unit in FAO for her for enlightening us uh, with her vision. We are all very happy to work with FAO uh, and other uh, UN agencies on research and innovation in science-based areas, because I think it's a necessity. And indeed, as Raoul said, science and innovation are recognized as strong leverage to find the solutions and transform our societies. Our world is facing a great number of tensions where the interests of the ones can come in conflict of the uh, well-being of more vulnerable populations. And the first uh, world report uh, on sustainable development carried by uh, GSDR in 2019 uh, shows, uh, identifies the problem of the transformation of food systems 
as one of the six most promising leverages to meet sustainable development goals by 2030. So we keep hope in reaching this uh, 2030 agenda. However, uh, in the view of all the crises that are intensifying, the challenges we have to face, uh, increasing inequalities within countries, within communities, increase of poverty, of fragilities, and all this fragilizes a uh, world food system. And we think that global interconnections have never been that strong. And our role has never been that important. Sustainable food systems need to be adapted to climate change and reduce our uh, greenhouse emissions, we need to restore degraded soils and ecosystems. It was very interesting to have the presentations on microbiome that can be part of an answer to meeting the challenges and also give, uh, well, take into account the value of ecosystemic services. Our research appro approach needs to be cross-disciplinary. Uh, it needs to involve uh, several stakeholders to be inclusive, to identify the problems, the targets, and most uh, important, the solutions. In IRD, uh, as well as in other institutions, we work on uh, in deploying uh, this uh, uh, scientific approach, we work on broadcasting our results and our work. And this is part of our key values and principles. And we also want to open research to more uh, multilateralism and involve uh, country, South countries. It's one of our strong uh, targets as well as one uh, UN uh, one of uh, UN's targets. These analyses and propositions will be uh, taken into account by the United Nations because advisory to public policies is essential to move forward. And FAO has a new strategy for science and innovation that Prit just uh, uh, introduced us. So to conclude, uh, working together, united uh, with research and civil society, we will find sustainable solutions. Because if we can't uh, reach Agenda 2030, there will be problems. We hope uh, next edition of Science Day will be enriched by today's input. And we hope next um, edition can be uh, dedicated to exploring sustainability to uh, raise, to make, um, to find the solutions and transform our societies, especially on food systems. We also need, need to take into account local contexts, listen to, in, listen to indigenous people with their knowledge. And we also need to open up discussion to technology because technology has uh, a play, a role to play. We've talked of different approaches, methods uh, that are shared by diff different institutions. Uh, Serad, Enrae, and IRD, I really thank you for uh, 
attending this event. And once again, thank you to the organizers, especially Raoul and all of you who attended the event and see you next year. Thank you a lot, Valérie. We are now reaching the end of this day. Uh, we may have uh, one last surprise in the name of all uh, the permanent representation uh, of France and Roma. Uh, the organizers were Ségolène, Frédéric, Joachim, Selim, Serge, Emmanuel and Jean-Luc. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Antoine Bourlier and Frédéric Coase and all her colleagues from the three uh, communications uh, departments in CERAD, in Ray and IRD. Make the most of these playful and uh, joyful music moments to share uh, your impressions and use the chat to discuss. Uh, you can also listen to the replay session on YouTube and also want to greet all our colleagues who um, were part uh, of this uh, celebration for the first time. So International Science Day on Agriculture, Food, Environment. Our colleagues from Campus France, French Institute and CAST uh, Network. Um, this was a success and I'm sure we'll do even better next, next year. song I wrote You might want to sing it not for naught Don't worry Be happy In every life we have some troubles But when you worry You make it double Don't worry uh -uh. Be happy Don't worry Everybody's got the fever, baby.
C'est qu'avec les musiciens, ça continue et ça continue. Merci beaucoup Londres, merci beaucoup tout le monde. Bravo, merci. merci. Bonne journée à tous.